My name is Alex. Uh, I work for... Domain. Not Domain, but thank you very much for the t-shirt. I came here, I don't know if you saw me, I was like dripping in sweat. I ran, because I thought we were like starting. It said sticks, and I was like, oh no, I'm speaking, I should probably get there on time. No, I went to Blue Chili, not realising that it hadn't moved. <laughs> so thank you for the t-shirt. Uh, yes, that is my Twitter handle. I was super late to the party when it comes to Twitter. So, and my name is super long, uh, but the R is kind of crushed in the middle there. But if you're interested, uh, that is my Twitter handle. As mentioned, I work for Atlassian. My day-to-day -day is JavaScript, and I spend as well most of my time in React and React-related things. All right, uh, a little bit about me. Uh, I'll see if I can, I don't know if the clip is going to work. That's not you. Oh, oh no. Is that going to play? Yeah. I don't know if the sound will work. Oh, a really cute laugh. Anyway, that's my son. Uh, he's, I think, 14 months today-ish. Yes. <laughs> About that all. But yeah, he's super cute and keeps me really, really tired. Okay, so this is actually part two of a talk that I've given before and also of a blog that I posted. So there is some sort of assumed knowledge. I will run over some of the key points, but if you haven't read that, you're probably going to have a bad time. Uh, because I probably don't have time to go through all of those learnings to build on those. Uh, I will try and flesh out what I need to. If you have any questions at the end, feel free to yell out. Uh, if you do get completely lost, feel free to look that up and we'll kind of explain all the stuff that I'm not explaining tonight. Uh, so, big thing is disclaimers and tooling. Uh, when it comes to performance, every app is different. Uh, you're going to be doing different problems, different things. So it's really important to get comfortable and familiar with the tools around performance. I'm not going to go into them tonight. I mentioned them briefly in, in the last talk. Uh, in the blog, you can look that up. But there's so many great tools out there for measuring performance of your applications. And React, I think a month ago, released even like more inbuilt React uh, performance tooling. So you can use that. So all these lessons are derived from those tools. So when React releases their new render engine in however long it will be until they release it, uh, some of these learnings might, might change. Uh, so keep that in mind, but the tooling will, will stay pretty static. Cool, so a little bit of recap. Uh, this is a React tree. It's a very well-balanced tree. Your tree probably won't be as well-balanced, but it's good for illustrative purposes. So if you think of that as your root node at the top, and it renders out lots of nodes, and that's your standard kind of React app. Now, first render, the green indicates that we've had to render those elements, and that's what we want, because we want to show the user our current state when it first renders. Now, after that, we want to run an update. And really, the data change that we want to, it, the data that's changed is only relevant to that one leaf node that we have in the corner there. Unfortunately, the default behavior of React is it will re-render everything. Um, so if you, in this case, sorry, the contrast is a bit bad, but the yellow nodes have all re-rendered, they've all re-rendered. Uh, and what we've already really wanted was that path there. That was sort of the optimal render path. Um, but unfortunately, we rendered all of that. Now, in my kind of looking into the tooling and different things out there, the most expensive part of a React application is the render. Every time you call the render method, you're doing some sort of DOM diffing, and that's by far generally the most expensive operation you're doing. Uh, DOM diffing is amazing, it's one of the key features of React, which makes it so powerful, but at scale, and it's going to really, really hurt your app. So, putting context, we do some things with thousands of nodes, thousands of React components, and we're, we need to get sort of sub-16 millisecond renders for leaf nodes with some animations. Uh, and this sort of behavior, the default rendering, you, it just blows out. You're looking at 400 milliseconds, 700 millisecond renders as opposed to 16 millisecond renders if you're not doing anything clever. Cool, so what I derived last time was that in order to optimize your app, you need to return false from should component update as high up the tree as you can. That was sort of the big idea. You, so this is function on React components where you want to return, if you return false from that, it'll skip the render of, your, of yourself and also all of your children. So how do we do that? We make those checks really cheap, and we make them really easy. And I talked about how you can achieve that. Uh, and what I proposed 
for doing that was to denormalize your data, and I'll talk about what that is in a sec, uh, in order for you to make those checks easy and cheap. Unfortunately, that approach had a few problems. So the first problem, and this will explain denormalize and normalize state a bit, <coughs> is mixing state, sort of by definition, that's what denormalizing does. So if we look at this piece of data here, so it's a user's object and it's got two users in it, and it's got uh, these flags in it called is selected. Now those is selected flags didn't come from the server, they're from the UI state, maybe you've done something to select those users, and it's got a flag on there. And so we've mixed these two things together. This is known as denormalized. Uh, whereas this is normalized state, this is very similar to what you find in like a database, where you have everything is sort of isolated and you just use keys to sort of link between different pieces of data. Uh, so just keeping in your mind, denormalized kind of merged or munged together, and normalized is kind of tables, database tables, for the easy way to think about it, relational kind of data. So why do we denormalize in the first place? Uh, denormalizing, so this has some troubles. This has a, has, a, has a pain, all right? If you get an update from the server and you're using denormalized data, it's really hard to actually update your state. Because you've got, see those is selected flags? You need to maintain those between that update. You can't just junk that whole blob. You need to do some sort of smart update so that you're only updating the fields from the server and you're leaving the UI state as is. Whereas the model on the right, the normalized state, is actually really easy to swap out server data because say you get users from an endpoint, if you get new users, you just, just drop it straight into that part of the state and your selected user within reason can kind of stay as is. You didn't really need to touch it. You didn't need to worry about maintaining all those UI flags. There's only one UI flag. In complex UIs, you might have lots of them, four, five, six, nested, whatever, to control some of these more complex UI interactions. And they're really hard to maintain. Uh, typing does help, uh, but it's still kind of a pain to swap things out because you might need to loop over and pull out the survey data and put it in, and it just gets really gnarly. So why do we denormalize in the first place? This is what a should component update function looks like with really simple normalized data, uh, but yeah, really simplified normalized data, not really that much complexity to it. And this is an accurate should component update. And you can probably see that, I won't go through the code, but it's pretty gnarly. There's a lot of stuff in there. You probably need to test all that code as well, which sucks. Uh, but what really sucks about it is that you can, really, you can fall into two errors really quickly. Either redundant renders, so you let things through that you shouldn't let through, or worse, you block renders that you shouldn't be blocking. So you make some state update, should result in a render, and it doesn't. And these functions are horrible to write, horrible to maintain. Uh, and so you're going to have a really bad time if you're writing issue component update functions like this. Whereas if you use denormalized state, which is where I was mixing the entity state and the UI state, issue component update function turns into that. Because what you can do is you can use some tricks just to use reference equality, and you're really just checking that references are equal. So it's really cheap, really easy, really consistent. You can just use a decorator or something to put that on all your components at any kind of time, as long as you structure your state in a certain way. So, the first solution to the first problem of I don't want to use denormalized state is just use normalized state. But unfortunately, as I mentioned, you're going to have these really ugly should component update functions if you don't do anything smart. Uh, and that's going to just blow out in complexity and probably give you a really bad performance or bugs. So what can we do to keep that normalized state without those terrible should component update checks? So hold that question in your mind. I'm going to show you some other problems, but they'll all be solved sort of by the same kind of stuff. So this is our tree again. We're going to start looking at our tree a little bit differently. We're going to look at our tree in terms of which nodes are able to, to, to read from the global state. Now I'm going to call these connected components. If you use React Redux, you're probably familiar with the term smart dumb. I'm not a huge fan of that language, so I'm going to go with connected and unconnected components. So connected components are ones that are connected to the Redux store. I'm using a Redux store here, you could use sort of any flux kind of pattern. So connected ones are aware of global state. They're aware of the state management. Whereas unconnected components, all they can do is receive props, call callbacks, and render stuff. That's sort of the difference. Whereas connected ones are more aware of your specific state management for your app. This is sort of out of the box, what you'll be doing. So you get an update, 
in your global store, you connect your components notified by the subscription, it renders, renders out the next child, renders out that child. Cool. So in this diagram, it actually exposes another problem. So if we look at this app tree, in order to render that leaf node, I've had to render down. Now, uh, because that bottom leaf node had no way of communicating directly with the store, all the props that it needed needed to be passed all the way down to the leaf. Now, what me that means is that often parents need to pass through props that they shouldn't have to care about. I'm going to show a demo of that with my octopus shortcut. Okay, I will zoom in, don't worry. Once I get to the right place, we're done with props. Okay. One second. Okay. Can everyone see that okay? Is that okay font size? So, we have this component here called task. So we have a task list application. And what it takes is it takes a... So we have this task shape, so this is the props. It takes a title and a due date, uh, which is a date. Uh, and then our task component takes both a task and the current date. So we're storing the current date in the store. And we might want to do that because of internationalization reasons, there might be other reasons. This, up, this up example's pretty contrived, but it's so we have this single implementation. Oh, thank you. Oh, no, it's okay. I won't be doing this one long. Okay. So then we come down here, this is our task component. So what it does is it simply just renders is overdue if the due date is greater than current date. I have no idea if this actually works, so it's kind of mashed it into this editor. But you get the idea. So, but then we have this task list, right? Now, it takes the list of tasks and then maps over them and returns a task component. But you'll see here, I had to pass in the current date into task because it needed it to do that overdue check. But this component didn't need current date at all. And so that implementation, that component's API has leaked into its parent, even though it didn't need it at all for its, for its purposes. So there's an alternative one where you can do some kind of gnarly trick to pass through props that you don't explicitly require. So you just say, hey, got some extra props, so I'm going to delete the one that I know about and then pass it through to my child. Um, now this is kind of crappy because it's not a very firm API for this component. Uh, so you've kind of said, anything extra that I got given that I didn't know about, just pass them to my kids. And that way you don't need to leak your API, your API stays pretty low. But this is kind of crappy as well and I think this might even have performance implications. So. This is probably not the best way to go either. All right. Another optical shortcut. Okay. So, and third problem, redundant parent renders. So we'll go back to this. Connected component gets an update. Render. Okay, we've done the first child render. We've had to do, in this case, three should component updates on those other children to say, hey, if you want to render, no, yes, no. Okay. So we've now done the issue component update checks to, to block rendering where we didn't need to. And at scale, this kind of can suck because the deeper your tree gets, the more leaf nodes you have, the more should component update checks you're gonna do. These checks are usually pretty cheap, but at scale, like they do start to hurt a little bit, so that's something to be aware of. But something that kind of really sucks is that, see those two parent components? Technically, we didn't need to render them in the sense that really we only wanted the leaf node to render. It's render method to call. The other, the parents, we didn't necessarily want to render, but we needed to to get to that child. <coughs> so, now I'm going to start talking about partial solutions. So there's, I think there's three partial solutions when combined together will solve all of these problems. In isolation, then they're not going to. So keep that in mind. Partial solution, more stored connections. So this is what we started with. I'm proposing instead of use something like this. So you wrap all your components that you really want to. There's sort of very no almost no drawback in having many, many connected components. And they can all listen to the store. This doesn't like, like break one-way data flow. They all get notified synchronously of an update. Um, 
that happen and they get given the global state. Why does this help? Um, oh, also, just kind of terminology, some of them I didn't highlight. Some of them don't, maybe don't make sense to be connected to the store. They're so tightly coupled to their parent that maybe doesn't make sense for them to actually have their own independent subscription. So that's why I've left some off the bottom as well. So what you'll use is you'll use some sort of higher level component to do this, and I'll go through that in a sec as well. So what that means is then you can do this, you'll get an update, and I don't know if you can see it, but just that one there has rendered. Nothing else. So you didn't have to render any appearance, so you're having a good time. Okay, so what, is, what does a connected component look like? I think a lot of us use React Redux, uh, but I'm going to actually lift up the wood and see what that looks like. So here's one I prepared earlier. One sec. So I'm assuming we have a Redux store. Um, this is just a shape of that, what I expect that store to look like. So what this is, is this is sort of a root level component. And what it's going to do is it's going to put the store on the context. Now I'm not going to talk about context and what it is and what you should use it for tonight. But simply what I'm doing is putting this in the context so that any component can reach in and grab the store off the context. This is what you need to do that. And then, this is my very simple React Redux, which works. Just for reaching in to the store. It doesn't actually have dispatch, but I won't talk about that. So simply, it's a function that returns a function. Didn't need to be. And what this does, <clears throat> firstly, it creates itself, takes a reference to the store, and hydrates the initial state. So what this function maps state to props, you can call it whatever you want. But what it's doing is it's taking the global state. So this function takes the global state, the component's props, and returns you what that component needed to render. And we'll show you, I'll show you an example of what that looks like. So when we mount, this is like the initial hydration. When we mount, we create a subscription. Uh, anytime the state changes, we again run that function. I'll talk about this in a sec. Uh, and then we call set state. So we're sort of using the React state mechanism. So when you do set state, it only renders itself and its children. So when we get new state, we call set state, and we pass this thing in, and that will call render. And this wrap component is the thing that we wrapped in. So now, it, and it will pass down the state as its props. So what does that look like? Uh, Connect.test. This code's a little bit funny, but we'll go for it. All right, so this is a user component, really simple. It takes a user object and returns the user's name. Uh, don't worry about the memwise thing for now. What's important is this function. So we go map state to props, so it gets the global state uh, and its own props and hydrates the user. So what that means is this is the, the connected component. So connected user kind of wraps around a, a unconnected user component, and it uses this function to hydrate its props. And so if you look down here in the render method of a user list, you can see that a connected user, all it takes is a user ID. So it just takes a user ID, and then it uses the store to look up the entire user. So in this case, it's just state.users.something. Right, this can be a little bit hard to work your head around. Uh, feel free to look up React Redux. After this, if you're interested, or feel free to come talk to me. But the idea is that each component can independently query the store. And that instantly, that has some good stuff and some bad stuff, and we'll talk about that. Okay. So what are some of the challenges of this approach? One, redundant rendering, and two, expensive queries. These are probably the two big problems. So let's break it down. So now we have an app that looks like this. I didn't render out, put the whole tree in there because it gets messy. So now this component on our left has a potential, so it's connected to the store and has a potential update. I don't know why I put it in red, but sort of to highlight it. So here's the steps. Firstly, that state, get, that's, that connected component gets an update. So it says the store goes, hey, something changed. Then what we do is we run our query slash selector. Depends on what you want to say. I like the word query, it runs a query on the state. So it asks the store, it, it uses a function to get some data back from the store. Right. 
And then thirdly, if the result is not equal to the previous result, then render. And if it is equal, then there's no point rendering. Now this gets quite chatty. Right, this is a really basic one, as you can keynote. Uh, but you can see all those green and red lines, right? Um, there's problems with that. So the green ones are pretty cheap. They're just subscriptions, like event listeners, but the red ones are pretty expensive. So let's just look at those. So these are the queries. These are the things that when given, when told that something changed, they execute some function against the state. Now this will kill you at scale if you don't do anything good about it. Because if you're returning a new result, say you're returning a new object every time, even if it's functionally equal, you need, you'll either need to be doing deeper quality checks, which are really expensive, uh, or you're just going to be doing lots and lots of redundant renders, because even if you're using pure components, you're going to say, hey, different, re different reference, I'm going to re-render. So by default, you're going to have a bad time with this. So partial solution, memoization. So what is memoization? If a function is called more than once with the same arguments, you can skip the execution of the function and return the previously calculated result. This assumes that the function is pretty pure, so if it gets the same inputs, it's going to get the same outputs. Oh, that's by me. Demo time. Lots of demos time. Great. Okay. Here's actually the library I've been writing because I was inspired by this tool. So, we have an add function. Now, I wrapped it in a sign and spy. Uh, so, what this will do is it will kind of give me some information about how this function was called. Really simple. It takes one number and another number and returns the sum of those numbers. This is our flow annotation, so it's just some TypeScript, sorry, not TypeScript, it's type checking kind of stuff for JavaScript. Uh, and then what I'm doing is this is a memwise add. So I've passed this function into another one called memwise1. So memwise1, what it is, is it's a memwise function which only has a cache size of one. So it's only gonna remember the, the last arguments that it was called. So if the last arguments are the same as what it was before, it's just gonna return you the same result. So what that means is, say you go, okay, yep, I get three. Okay, if I do this, if I call it twice, I get the same result. Uh, but what's interesting is in this case, I'm calling it twice, but the add function was only called once. So I'm getting three in both cases, so they're both returning three, but my underlying function, the add function, was only ever called once. And this is sort of the real key of doing this approach, is memoizing function calls. And you can, if you're interested, I'm just putting up on NPM now, uh, you can play with this later. I think that's the last code example. So I'm just trying to stop jumping around. Cool. Now, memoization. So, assume we don't have memoization. I know this is a late night, and it's getting, this is like the really meaty, meaty side of it, uh, but bear with me, it's almost over. Uh, there's not too much more, but this is the real key of getting connected components working in a highly performant way. So up here we have a subscription, then we get some, we say new state equals map state to props. We get the current application state, and we pass in the props, okay. Now, assume we don't use any sort of memoization. What's going to happen? We'll go down to that is shallow equal check, and chances are we'll probably get a false if we're not using any kind of memoization. And so we'll skip that optimization and we'll use a set state. And because they're different references, your component isn't going to help you either, you're going to get a re render. So that's if you're using this sort of function here by default, you're going to have uh, not a good time. Now, down the bottom, I've written a memoize query. And you could pass that into your connect component instead. And then what would that look like? So first thing, map state to props would potentially be a NOAA, and just return the same, exactly the same value, same reference that you had before. And then that is shallow equal check would simply check some reference equality uh, and return, and you wouldn't skip that render. 
Another partial solution is often selectors get fairly complex. If you've played with reselect, this will look kind of familiar. But the idea is that you can actually have multiple levels of memoization. So what I told you was just like one level memoization, you can have multiple. So the idea is you want to break up your queries into sub-queries. Really, and like, so instead of having one really big expensive query, you break it up into its parts. And then so you can do like, hopefully you want to exit whenever you get some cheap checks that finish well. So what would that look like? So say in this case, get current user and get product. If they returned new, new references, then you'd have to execute your result function. However, if they both return the same reference, then you could just skip your result function altogether and return the previous result. If you are interested, Phil, please look up reselect. It talks about this in much more detail than I'm going to go into here. It's really interesting stuff. If, you, if you're interested in memoization as well, look at their source code. It's only about 50 lines long, and it's got like 4,000 stars. Uh, really interesting techniques around memoization in there, and like nested memoization. There's some tips around writing good queries. Uh, aggressively lean on patterns and shapes that allow you to leverage memoization. So you want to be breaking up your state tree in such a way that you can kind of you want to cut out as much of the state changing as possible and isolate your state as much as possible. It goes into this in the reselect in a bit more detail. But what this means is you want to try and... If you get a state change over here, you don't want it causing invalid uh, memoization cache busts on this side of the tree. Okay, so the more you can kind of split that state out and break those selectors up, the more chance you'll have of your memoization not break busting. Uh, and two, this is just the same, just good to keep in mind, is that when you are updating your state, only update the, only clear, like, invalidate references of state that you're actually changing. If you're not changing anything, don't, don't invalidate the reference, because otherwise it's going to bust your memorization caches. Uh, yeah, as I mentioned, further reading on selectors and memorization stuff. And this is a big takeaway, if you have a camera. It's probably the slide to take a photo of. So this is the problems with denormalized state. So mixing entity and UI state, redundant props and redundant parent renders, and the solution is use connected components, make sure you're using memoized queries, uh, and use smart nesting of queries. Nesting of queries doesn't automatically equal, that's why I said smart, nesting of queries doesn't automatically mean good performance. You need to really know how your state shape works, what actions invalidate those state, what state your component needs, how you can break up those selectors or queries. And you're gonna have a really good time. All right, thanks. <laughs> Questions, do we have another mic or should I hand this mic around? Just repeat the question. Just one question, why don't people do all jet? Why not immutable JS? Uh, I think it just complicates matters. So you can either get immutability by using some sort of library, which has benefits too, but you get a huge kilobyte hit um, for something like immutable JS. So I personally just lean on reference quality, uh, and I use a library called Icepick to do deep object modifications, so you don't have to like spread all the way down. Uh, but yeah, immutable JS is great as well. It makes the is, is shallow equal check. I, could, I didn't show you the details of this, shall we go check, but it's really basic, it's just checking references, so there's nothing very complex in that. Uh, why I also like iSpeak is that it uses an object.freeze in, in dev, so you can see if you're having any problems, and then in prod it turns it off for performance. So you kind of get the protection as well as the speed. Yeah? What tooling are you measuring for speed to benchmarking? The question was what tools am I mentioning? So I didn't go into them um, before they were on the blog. So a lot of them, there's simple things like console.time, right, and time end. That's, that's kind of the bread and butter of them. React has some really nice metrics you can do. So you can like start a React timer and end it at certain points. You can do sort of aggregation of actions to see which ones take the longest. There's lots of, it's, and they're not specific to React. That's what I want to um, highlight. If you type in like React, I mean JavaScript performance tools, those sort of things you can, you can just use. Um, but React React is really nice because you can have middleware, and often you'll what you'll do is you'll start some sort of performance to, uh, metrics or timing or something, fire some actions and then stop it. And because the actions are synchronous, they'll form cause renders, and you can kind of 
pull out some information. Uh, there's some really cool like tools around that. You can kind of highlight which actions are the most take the most time, and yeah, there's lots of cool tooling around it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, testing connected components. So Leafs know. So Leaf nodes that wrap a unconnected component is pretty easy because you just have your default export is the connected, your name export is the unconnected. That's sort of the general pattern. Um, things that are higher up the tree are a little bit more gray because generally, say you have a task list that renders out connected tasks, you know, then you've automatically in your tests you have a dependency on the context. So you could either wrap it in a store provider and hydrate the context, something like that. Another option I've seen is if your ones that are higher up the tree, instead of your files returning components, they return functions, which take like the children component as arguments, and that lets you basically dependency inject the, the children. That's another way. I'm not. A, I don't know. I don't mind adding the context for the ones that are higher up the tree. It seems to be a bit cleaner, but there are ways of doing it. Yeah. So Enzyme has a really good tooling for putting. You can kind of put stuff in the context. When you when you render and stuff. Yes, question. Hi. Uh, so with two hours you talk, do you have metrics on the performance gains you had with the current wrapping everything and then like it'll be a blog post or something? Or? Uh, the question was do I have metrics around the current improvements? No. Um, in that they were done on like a micro level but not at as big a level as I would like just yet. But our initial investigations are really, really positive. So you start to get, when you flatten that state, the trouble is we had a lot of nested state. And at scale, you have to do a lot of looping, a lot of lookups, and it's really ugly to work with. When you work with normalized data, it's very flat, and your lookups can go to like 01, 01 lookups for everything. Uh, also for us, when we, we have, think of it like a Trello board, when we drag a card, every little movement is a render. And so at scale, the more cards we have on the page, sort of almost by default, the behavior gets worse. Whereas we're finding with this approach, we're getting linear performance because the connected component of the leaf is the only thing that's being rendered, nothing else is being rendered. Uh, and that kind of lean, leans into the, memori the how important doing memorization well. <coughs> but yes, probably when I do a blog, there'll be more actual numbers. Yep. Yeah, so just the comment was, yeah, just make sure the lookups are really fast. So ideally, like, O1 lookups for everything. And if you structure your data in such a way, that's actually, it's, it's really possible to do that. And if you do have some sort of nested ugly data, you can use some libraries to flatten it for you. I think, like, normalize JS is one or something, I'm not sure. You can actually denormalize your data from the front end. So you have, we, for example, have stores with a lot of data that's repeated itself, but only for the reason that the want to access it really, really quickly. And because we look with like many lines of data in the client side that actually pays off. So we have really, really fast things. Because we're never doing any queries. Yeah, so the, um, I guess the takeaway is there's going to be lots of different optimizations. You need to think about what your state shape is uh, and how that memorization works and when it's, when it's going to bust. Because ideally you want it to bust as little as possible. You want, when you update a leaf node, you don't want it busting the cache for other leaf nodes. Um, so yeah, kind of use that as a guiding principle. And sheep lookups are good. <laughs> <laughs>